Sometimes we got to work real hard to get you in a place of understanding the power of praise. But praise has a strange dynamic because of its propensity to produce problems. You wouldn't think that something so simple, something so normal among believers, something that uh, should be common practice could make people mad. Okay, I'll bring it home then. Not everybody's happy that you got a new house. And when you testify and dance over it, some people get upset. Not everybody's celebrating your promotion. Some people are downright upset because they think you don't deserve it. Praise causes problems. Not only does it cause problems in our contemporary situation, not only does it cause problems with people that we deal with on a daily basis, but praise causes problems from your chief antagonist, which is the devil himself. Ezekiel lets us know that Satan, and I know we don't talk about the devil anymore because we think if we ignore him, he'll leave us alone. But I come to tell you tonight, the devil is real. And I know y'all trying to be all deep, but I'm looking for a few people that are tired of the devil running through your family. Tired of the enemy taking over your community. How many know you got power over the enemy? Come on, give me a touch your neighbor. Touch your neighbor and tell them, say, neighbor, you got power. You got power. So the devil is upset. Ezekiel says he was created for praise. His body was made of pipes and timbers when he moved. Praise came forth from his physical movement in a spiritual body. I wish I could talk to y'all. When he was cast down from his position, the space was left vacant. God created man. Let me tell you something. I know they told you your purpose was to get a new house. I know they told you your purpose was to be a millionaire. And I want you to get all of that. Get everything you can get and be a blessing to everybody you can be a blessing to. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be downright rich. Okay, Proverbs 10 and 22 said, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. I want you to be blessed. I want you to create jobs in your community. I want you to have more than enough so you can help everybody you come in contact with. But you were not created for a promotion. You were created for one primary reason, and that's to bring praise and glory to the name of the Lord. I wish you'd lean on your neighbor and say, Neighbor, I was created. For praise. So the enemy is upset because God filled the position with you. But praise causes problems from a natural perspective, from a physical perspective, and even from a spiritual perspective. Praise is your problem. It's when a prophecy comes to its time, nobody can stop it. I learned something about God. You don't have to be in a spiritually conducive environment for your prophecy to come to pass. See, some of y'all, Lord, take me off this job. I can't work for these people anymore. I can't take it. Oh, okay, let me help you. I know the proper or the, 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 the colloquialism of the church that works. If I want to tear a house down, all I got to do is say, grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm coming out. I know it. I know the come out message. But I come to preach something unpopular right now, and I come to tell you you're not coming out. And the reason why is because God has strategically placed you where you are. And he wants to take the person that's opposing you the greatest, turn them around and cause them to finance. He gave them a 501c3 grant for nonprofit organizations to go back and rebuild their temple. That's some preacher lingo for y'all. In other words, God wants to take your enemy and cause them to finance your destiny. Proverbs 13 and 22, let us know uh, that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I wish somebody in here would understand that you're in a bad place right now, but God is grooming you to be your boss's boss. Which means I can be in the middle of a storm 
destruction all around. But I don't see what you see. I see the sun. The problem with the come out message is the most intense part of a hurricane is the eye wall. Which means the moment you step out of the center of the storm into the wall, you come into the most intense part of the battle. That's the reason why revivals generally put people in bondage. Because preachers are pulling you out of the center of a trial into the most intense part of the attack. But I come to tell you, if you can stay in the center of it, if you can maintain under strain, rest under stress, God's getting ready to bless you in the middle of all hell breaking loose most of what the enemy is saying to you in the spirit realm he's trying to punk you out of your prophecy see the enemy only attacks what God is about to release which means he's talking but he doesn't have the punch to back what he's saying so by the time he gets to your body by the time he shows up in the natural realm he's already lost his power that's why Isaiah 54 and 17 said no weapon formed against thee shall prosper every tongue that rises against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn it for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me saith the Lord in other words by the time what the devil is saying catches up to my life God has already turned Turn it around. All right. In other words, the worst situation of your life is not trying to take you out. It's trying to produce power. When you go through something, don't get upset. Don't fall out. Don't get mad with people. You got to understand that God is working something down on the inside. And when you come out of it, you're going to be more powerful than when you went in. You've been sown in Babylon. You've been sown by the people that said you wouldn't make it. Your praise has been sown by people who tried to cut you off. Your praise has been sown by people who tried to step over you. Because when God raises you up. Let me work. Let me work. Let me work. I'm working. Let me work. Let me work. Let me work. Okay, I don't have time for this, but if y'all let me say this, I'm going to bless you right here. I really believe that you limit yourself when you ask for something. Ephesians 3 and 20 said, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think, according to the power of that work within you. Now, I'm not saying don't ask for stuff, but you got to watch your mindset when you do it. Because the truth is, the highest level you can think, God is obligated to do more. Did y'all see that? So I came to a place where I said, Lord, you've been doing things so much greater than what I ask. I'm going to stop asking and just let you do what you do. Because obviously, when I'm thinking five bedrooms, you're thinking ten. So why limit myself to what I think I can have? Oh, oh, put your hand on your head and say expansion, expansion, expansion. Come on, if we're going to enlarge, we got to enlarge our capacity within our own mind. You've got to see something greater in your mind before you can see it in your life. Okay, side note. That was a side note. Watch this. Watch this now. Tobiah, this is the season when God is bringing us back to him like never before. We're running back to prayer. You know, we got all these people in here. If I were to say that, uh, in fact, and I wanted to say this to all, oh, everybody I've asked about this preacher just loves him. From Noel Jones to Jathan Austin down the street, it's good when people in your own backyard speak good of you. Yeah. Marvin Sapp, everybody spoke well of him. But if I said that Noel Jones is going to be here in the morning at 5 a.m. for a special uh, service he's going to be preaching, we'd have to go rent the Coliseum. At 5 in the morning. If that ain't your preacher, then Jake's or whoever your preacher is. But anyway, if I said Shane Perry was going to be here at 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Don't do it. That was, I was sad. I should have needed a little love right there. But, but, but if I said we were going to have noonday prayer, I promise you we wouldn't have this crowd. I know it. Lie if you want to. I know it's the truth. Tell somebody, stop lying. stop lying. Because we don't understand the power of prayer. We don't understand the importance of prayer. Where did this little white guy come from? I'll tell you where I came from. I came from prayer. 
6 a.m. prayer at my church, noonday prayer at my church, 10 a.m. prayer at my own house. Prayer. Grab your neighbor, say, neighbor, there's power. Oh, power in your prayer. I'm sorry. I just, prayer gets me excited. I know the car gets you excited, but prayer gets me excited. I know the house gets you excited, but prayer gets me excited. Why? Because when I pray, I got power over the enemy. All right. But as we reconnect with God, God is doing a Tobiah type move. Tobiah was a faker. He presented something that he was not. This is the season God's about to remove every fake person out of your life. I'm so tired of fake and phony and I can't take it. I just... You got some of the fakest folks in church that you, I said it, I know it, I know it. But don't get mad at the church. You got fake people on your job. Fake people at the grocery store. You go in, get what you want and leave. Amen. You got fake people everywhere, but there's something about fake church folks. They know how to talk right. They wear the right church clothes. They got all the colloquialisms down. I'm blessed and highly favored growing like the trees in Lebanon. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Just a full of demons. Come on. Out shout you, out sing you, out preach you, and ain't even saved. That's church people. They got the anointing to lie. You know that anointing? I mean, they'll take enough of a lie with the truth. Mix it up, and by the time they get done, you say, man, maybe I did do that. <laughs> this is a season God's removing fake out of your life. And guess what? God's going after the fake in you, too. We got to get honest. We got to get real. Listen, don't come to church with a problem, sit in the back and act like you got it all together. If you got a problem, forget about everybody around you. Run down to this altar, throw up your hands and say, Lord, what's ever in me that's not like you, I want to be delivered. I want to be set free. I'm tired of what I'm in. I need a change. Let me finish. The devil knows when the real New Year is. Which means when you celebrate the secular new year, January the 1st, you got all these high hopes. And that's good. You're supposed to. You're supposed to look for something different, something new. Now, I do it every day, but, you know, it's a new year. But isn't it funny that January, February, March, the attack is intense against your life. I'm telling you, in March, it's like all the 2011 problems start showing up in 2012. Am I right about it? Here's the reason why, because the devil knows the real new year is in April. And Isaiah says that the anointing destroys the yoke. So your flesh and your mind and the devil all team up to try to keep you from the mechanism that can birth your breakthrough. Can I talk to y'all? So I learned how to come to church and talk to my flesh. And say, I know you don't feel like dancing. I know you don't feel like shouting. I know you don't even feel like standing up. But David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And when I can make myself praise, it don't take long until I feel God's anointing. And when his anointing shows up, every yoke has to be destroyed.